Developing right now on Morning News Now, a grim new phase of war unfolding in Gaza as Israel's military pushes deeper into the south. Now civilians being forced to evacuate again while the UN warns there is nowhere safe to go. This as Israel and its allies accuse Hamas of using rape as a weapon of war and keeping women hostages in captivity. The reason this pause fell apart is they don't want those women to be able to talk about what happened to them during their time in custody. We have team coverage with the very latest. Also this morning, parts of the Northwest pummeled by snow from a storm that's now prompting fears of flash flooding. We are tracking the conditions plus a separate storm system on the East Coast. And new information about a mysterious illness sickening dogs around the country. What you need to know to keep your furry friends safe. Plus, a downsizing downer. Music giant Spotify announces it's laying off hundreds of employees. More on the cuts that are causing concern across the tech world. A bit of a shocker because they made a lot of money in the third quarter. I know, and we've all been talking about them for sure with their Spotify wrapped coming out. Exactly. <laughs> you see it all over social media, more but it's on, a big story. More on that coming up in a little bit. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started today in the Middle East where Israel is expanding and intensifying its offensive on southern Gaza. Israeli forces are targeting the city of Khan Yunis with heavy bombing and artillery fire as Hamas continues to fire rockets as Israel. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says hundreds of Palestinians have been been killed and injured since the truce between Israel and Hamas fell apart last Friday. Well, 80 percent of Gazans are now said to be displaced. We're going to bring you one family's tragic story from inside Gaza. The IDF's assault continues as the U.N. tries to push Israel to protect civilians. The humanitarian corridor for the occupied Palestinian territory said in a statement, quote, nowhere is safe in Gaza and there is nowhere left to go. The conditions required to deliver aid to the people of Gaza do not exist. An even more hellish scenario is about to unfold, one in which humanitarian operations may not be able to respond. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent David Noriega, who joins us now from Tel Aviv. So, David, we have another warning from the U.N. now about the situation in Gaza. Walk us through what, what the latest on what's been happening. Yeah, hey, Joe and Savannah. So the U.N. says that about 1.9 million people, which is 80 percent of the population of the Gaza Strip, has been displaced in this war. Many of them were displaced from the north into the south, and now the south is where the fighting has happened. The U.N. also says that many of those people are now essentially being concentrated, packed into an area that is less than one-third of the Gaza Strip. The IDF says that it is taking all precautions to minimize civilian casualties. It's dropped leaflets, ordering people to evacuate, telling them to go to the existing shelters, but according to the UN, those shelters are overwhelmed. We're seeing video of thousands of people moving south from Khan Yunis, where a lot of the fighting is concentrated towards Rafa, uh, which is, you know, on or close to the Egyptian border. Uh, we're seeing videos of, of children being treated in hospitals that are completely overwhelmed, almost to the point of near inoperability. And what we're hearing from people on the ground is that they fear there is absolutely nowhere for them to go, except maybe across the border into Egypt. But they don't want want to do that. Uh, and Egypt doesn't want them to do that either. I want to play you a little bit of a clip uh, from some video of a, of, a, of a displaced Palestinian describing the situation. Take a listen. They're displacing us from one place to another, pushing us to Rafah. After Rafah, God knows. There isn't any safe place. Any place we go is worse than the one we have been in. Again, there is widespread fear that people will eventually be pushed over that border into Egypt. But unless Egypt allows that to happen, it's not clear where exactly these people are going to go. Back to you. David, tell us also what we are hearing from the United States. I mean, I know we are also urging the minimization of civilian casualties. What kind of pressure is the Biden administration putting on Israel? Right. So uh, several U.S. officials have been making statements saying that they are urging Israel to use more restraint in this round of fighting compared to what they did uh, prior to the ceasefire in the north. Um, for example, uh, here's uh, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller speaking on this question. 
We do not want to see a military campaign uh, in the north, in the south, that looks like the north. And what we mean by that, we do not want to see the same level of civilian casualties. We do not want to see the same level of mass displacement. What we have made clear to Israel is that we expect them to comply with international humanitarian law and do them do everything they can to minimize civilian harm, so we don't see a repeat in the south of what we saw in the north. So even though that's what we're hearing from people like Miller and like Vice President Kamala Harris, we also heard from NSC spokesperson John Kirby over the weekend that he believes the Israelis have been receptive to this pressure. Uh, he said, quote, we saw them go in with less force. Uh, at, at the same time, a senior U.S. official told NBC News yesterday that he was surprised by the ferocity with which Israel has reinitiated, reinitiated its campaign. So at this moment, we're getting really contradictory mes messages from the U.S. on the question of how Israel is actually responding to this pressure, that just means that we don't actually know if or how that pressure is actually translating to a change of tactics on the ground. And based on the video we're seeing, it, it's not clear that it is translating at all. Back to you guys. David, we also want to talk about the situation in the occupied West Bank, where the number of Palestinians being killed or arrested by Israel continues to rise. Real quickly, what's the latest there? Yeah, so uh, according to sources in the West Bank, the number of people who have uh, died in the West Bank, both since the beginning of the conflict, but then also since the end of the ceasefire, is, ri is rising. There was a significant IDF raid in the area of Janine uh, just in the last day. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the numbers, the numbers, those numbers are going up too, right? It's important to think of what's happening in Gaza and what's happening in the occupied West Bank as connected. Typically, we see when there is a rise in, uh, in hostilities in one place, we see a rise in hostilities in the other. That's very much what's been happening in the West Bank since the beginning of this conflict both in terms of uh, settler violence against Palestinians and also uh, uh, sp uh, military and police operations. Uh, the IDF, I should say, says that these operations are uh, intended to uh, go, they're, they're done for security reasons. They're intended to go after security threats, terrorists and, and people like that. Back to you guys. All right, David Noriega, thank you so much. Thank you, David. Well, a few weeks ago, we reported on the 39 premature babies who were stuck inside the besieged Al-Shifa hospital in northern Gaza, cut off from their families. Well, 31 survived and were eventually evacuated to Egypt. NBC's Erin McLaughlin spoke with one mother who was reunited with her child. Noor Albana can't take her eyes off her little girl. She's beautiful. Her name is Leanne, she tells us. A moment this new mother once feared impossible, now overwhelming. That was your first time touching your daughter? Yes. yes. I'm very happy, she says. Nor thought she might never see Leanne and her twin sister again. The girls were among some 39 babies separated from their families as violence engulfed the Al Shifa hospital. RPGs. Israel, the U.S., and AK the European Union allege Hamas used hospitals to conceal its military operations and patients as human shields. Allegations Hamas denies. Days into the siege, doctors say the babies began to die. These images of the sick babies emerged from Al Shifa. While at the evacuated Al Nasser Hospital, this footage of the remains of babies left behind. The Hamas run health ministry says they were prevented from evacuating them. Israel slamming that as false, but also a perverse exploitation of innocent lives. Back at Al Shifa, 31 babies made it out alive. A dozen brought here to a Cairo hospital. They brought them for us with a very bad general condition. Uh, now, more or less stable. Dr. Mohammed Abu Sakin says all but two are alone. Dr. Sakin takes us to see baby Halama, known only by his mother's name. What happened to his eye? Uh, removed, explosion. All the building, all the neighbors died. Doctors say this is what baby Halama looked like when he arrived, now growing stronger every day. The only sleeping. I dream by this boy. You dream of this boy? Yes. What, what Actually. Do, what do you dream? I dream that he's happy. This boy is happy. As the bombs drop in Gaza, that dream for all its children never seemed so far away. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Cairo.
The Biden administration is warning that money used to provide weapons and equipment to Ukraine will run out by the end of the year unless Congress passes a supplemental spending request. It comes as bipartisan Senate negotiations on immigration collapse, threatening to derail the White House national security package. Now, that includes aid to both Ukraine and Israel. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has more. Hey, Savannah, good morning. This is no doubt a crucial period of time as the White House continues to impress upon members of Congress how important it is to extend aid to Ukraine at a crucial time in their war against Russia. And they're going to bring in the biggest name in Ukraine to make that case. President Vladimir Zelensky is expected to address senators during a classified briefing remotely where he will impress upon them just how dire the situation there is. Now, this comes after the director of Office of Management and budget uh, sent uh, congressional leaders a letter yesterday telling them that essentially the administration is out of money to help Ukraine and that new aid needs to come as soon as possible. Now, this is all wrapped up in a wider discussion about a broad supplemental aid package that is not only going to include money for Ukraine, but also money for Israel and a border security package. And it's that border security piece that has been the difficult part for Republicans and Democrats to agree upon. And Republicans Republicans are making it clear that they are not going to provide the aid to Ukraine without serious changes to the situation at the border. And that means more than just money. They also want policy changes. So those negotiations will continue today. There is the expectation that the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will put a bill on the floor that would allow for that Ukraine funding. But Republicans are expected to block it to force more negotiations around the border package. This is something that the White House is insistent needs to happen and needs to happen as soon as possible. Savannah? All right, Ryan, thank you so much. The Supreme Court seemed conflicted yesterday when considering whether to approve a bankruptcy settlement linked to the nation's opioid crisis. It's a deal that would give billions to victims of the epidemic, but as NBC News now anchor Kate Snow explains, it would also shield the family that helped create OxyContin from future liability lawsuits. This abuse of bankruptcy! They are one of the most infamous families in America, with their role in creating Purdue's popular painkiller, OxyContin, the subject of popular shows and movies. It's so poison, Billy. What's that? That's all this is. It's so poison. The Supreme Court hearing arguments over a bankruptcy court deal that shields the Sackler family from future liability from lawsuits in exchange for paying $6 billion to help victims of the opioid crisis. What it means is that the family members cannot be sued civilly by anybody, even those who disagreed with the settlement. So that's the issue before the Supreme Court. The deal took years to craft and was approved by a lower court. Lawyers for the Justice Department arguing that since the company filed for bankruptcy, but not members of the Sackler family, the Sacklers should not be protected from lawsuits. It would raise serious due process concerns and Seventh Amendment concerns. The justices appeared conflicted, expressing both reservations about the deal and concerns about overturning it. It's overwhelming, the support for this deal, among people who think that the Sacklers are pretty much the worst people on earth. Um, they've negotiated a deal which they think is the best that they can get. Ellen Isaacs does not think it's the best deal they can get. She and her son Ryan were both OxyContin users. He died of an overdose five years ago. She wants those who've suffered to be able to sue the Sacklers. You've done this to our families. You've killed our children. You've created all kinds of mental health problems across the entire country. And it's just wrong. And you need to finally step up. A Supreme Court decision is expected in the coming months. Kate Snow, NBC News. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas for more on this case. Danny, good morning. So as we just heard there, the justices, they seem to be conflicted over the deal in some cases. Tell us what and also maybe who between the justices stood out to you. Well, the big argument here, the big concern for someone like Justice Gorsuch is whether or not, and excuse my voice is a little raspy today, but the big concern for Justice Gorsuch is this. If all the parties agree to this deal, but the deal may be against the rules of bankruptcy court, is it still a viable deal? Mm. And then 
do all the parties really even agree to this? Because there are other people who may sue the Sacklers in the future. They're going to be affected by this settlement. They won't be able to sue if they want to bring a lawsuit later on. So it really isn't the case that everybody is on board with this settlement because there could be other plaintiffs mm. in the future who want to sue the Sacklers and they would be left out in the cold. Let's talk about this settlement. What's in it? What do families who have been impacted by opioids get from this settlement? It it's through? money. And the key is it's money to today, and this is the great dilemma with every settlement. I go through this mm. every time I settle a case. Do you want money today or the prospect of maybe more money five years from now, 10 years from now, or no money at all mm. if the Sacklers or if the defendant doesn't have any money when this case finally ends? So this is a business decision that every party has to make in a lawsuit. And interestingly enough, the Sacklers are not parties. They're outsiders who are going to benefit from this settlement by saying, hey, here's the deal, guys. And it really, bankruptcy law is very complicated, but what the Sacklers want to do is actually very simple. They're outsiders to this case, and they're saying, hey, guys, we can sweeten the pot. We'll throw in an extra few billion, but in return, we don't ever want to be a party to a lawsuit. We want you to release not only the parties in the bankruptcy case, but us, and we are bystanders. Bystanders who are going to benefit by putting money into this settlement and never being sued again. And that will bind, and this is something Justice uh, Gorsuch was concerned about, that will bind people who are not even involved in this lawsuit. So in the future, somebody comes forward and says, we need to sue the Sacklers. Sorry, you're out of luck. This mm. case is already over. You never had a chance. Justice Kavanaugh made the point yesterday that bankruptcy courts have been approving plans like this for decades. Is that right, or how does this differ? In a sense, it's true. I mean, that's the essence of bankruptcy court. In its simplest terms, you have a debtor. You have a corporate debtor or an individual debtor who says, I can't pay my bills. So now let's go to court and we'll line up all the people that I owe money to and we'll put them in priority. And at the end of it, I will be released as a debtor. I can go forward and maybe start my life over. So this kind of thing happens all the time. What is novel really is that you have the Sacklers who are simply not involved in this case. Mm. But again, as outsiders, they're saying, we can make this a better deal for everyone by throwing in more money, more money that just may not be around in the future. So it really is kind of almost an ethical dilemma. If everybody's on board and everybody benefits now from this case, this uh, settlement going forward, should we allow it? Should we promote it, even if it might be stretching the rules? Mm. Danny Savalos, as always, we appreciate you. Thanks. Tomorrow night, the Republican Party will hold its fourth debate, and only this time four candidates have qualified to appear on stage under the GOP's new rules. NBC News Digital senior political reporter Jonathan Allen joins us now with more. So, uh, John, Who's scheduled to be in the debate tomorrow? <laughs> uh, we're going to see some of the same familiar faces, Joe and Savannah. We're going to see uh, v uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. We're going to see Nikki Haley. We're going to see Ron DeSantis. And uh, as a late finisher in meeting the debate criteria, we're going to see Chris Christie, the uh, former governor of New Jersey. And who won't be on the stage. <laughs> and if I recall, I believe there were five in the last one. Is that right? Joe, sadly, you will not be on the stage. Savannah, also, you will not be on the stage. Uh, happily, I will not be on the stage. But uh, the, the, big, uh, the big thing in terms of who's not going to be on the stage is actually South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, who uh, suspended his campaign after the last debate. So people who have been watching the debates won't see him from the last debate. But from previous debates, uh, the big news yesterday was that Doug Burgum, uh, the North Carolina, uh, sorry, North Dakota governor, had suspended his campaign. Uh, he was not going to make that debate stage. So under these new rules, what did it take to qualify for the debate tomorrow? What we're seeing with each round is uh, a higher qualification criteria. Uh, the big one that was difficult for candidates to meet this time around was the 6% uh, polling in national polls and in uh, certain state polls. So uh, we saw actually uh, Christie, um, Christie looked like he was going to be short of that 6% uh, threshold until yesterday. and. Uh, he has made the debate stage, like I said, a, a late entrant there. So the criteria for this debate higher than the last one. Not everyone's happy about it. So two questions here. Who's pushing back against the higher threshold? And is there anyone who just is under incredible pressure to just have a strong night mm. tomorrow night in order to keep their campaign going? Um, so first, a great question, Joe. I, you know, first of all, um, you know, the, the people who are pushing back against these debate criteria are the people who do not make the debate stage for those who are able to make it. It's helpful to them to not have uh, their competitors on stage. They're not looking to expand the field any of anything. Uh, these candidates are looking to narrow the field. 
Uh, they're trying to get to a place, each of them, uh, where they could go one-on-one -on -one with Donald Trump. Um, not clear that uh, any of them would beat Donald Trump one-on-one, -on -one, but they certainly uh, believe, and I think appropriately so, they'd have a better chance. So then the question becomes, who has the most at stake uh, in this debate? You know, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy's campaign has been tailing off, so he's certainly somebody who um, you know, has a real need to have a, a good debate, particularly because his debate performance has informed his uh, performance in polls so far. Um, and then Chris Christie, the New Jersey governor, is getting a lot of pressure from some pre uh, fellow Republicans to get out, especially those who believe that his support would go to Nikki Haley, uh, those people who want that are supporters of Nikki Haley. Um, and, you know, Christie's argument has been he's the only one that's really taking on uh, Donald Trump head on, uh, that basically DeSantis and, and Haley are tiptoeing around Trump, and so there's not really a choice for Republican voters. Um, you know, if history is a guide, these candidates will stay in until they don't have enough money to make their plans fly. Mm. All right, we'll see how it all plays out tomorrow night. John mm -hmm. Allen, as always, thank you so much. It is another rainy, snowy day for the Northwest. For more on that, let's get a check on your morning news now forecast. Which means Angie Lastman is in studio with us. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. We've got flood concerns across that region. You just mentioned it's the Northwest that we're going to keep our eye on here through at least the next couple of days, potentially for flood concerns all the way into the weekend. We've got 9 million people under those flood alerts right now. What you see in the bright green is a flood watch. It does include Portland, Seattle, Spokane, and Eureka, so heads up to those places. We're going to look for uh, some potentially major rivers River flooding in western Washington through the next couple of days as well. And a big batch of moisture working on this morning. This is what it looks like on satellite and radar from Portland to Seattle. Some heavy rain working through. Lighter rain a little farther to the east over Spokane. But still, there's more where that came from. And we've got multiple storms that we're going to track here uh, as we go through really into the weekend. So today and tomorrow, this is the storm system that we're going to watch. Atmospheric river that's working a little closer to the coast. We've got another storm system on Thursday and then potentially a strong stronger one on Saturday. Let's show you today and tomorrow. This is the atmospheric river that works into the northwest. We'll see the potential for some really heavy rain. It's mainly going to be a rain event, but in those higher elevations, we could see some snow as well. It is a little warm, so those will be essentially the higher elevations, but still a heads up for folks that live in that area. We'll also see the potential for some really gusty winds closer to the coast, especially up to 40 miles per hour, maybe even higher. By the time we get into Thursday, a weaker system works on shore, uh, but still more rain on already saturated grounds is going to be problematic for folks that live in this area and you can see the snow that will stretch to the east as well. Now as we get into Saturday we've got a, likely another atmospheric river event that will be possible. The strength and the timing of it we're a little uncertain of right now but still looks like plenty of, of more plenty more moisture is going to work onto that coast. So it'll be a stretch of days where we will have that flood concern and when it's all said and done by the time we get into at least Thursday we could pick up maybe up to a half of a, a foot of of rain in places like the Cascades, a little less out towards the coast, but nothing to laugh at. We've got four to eight inches on tap for folks there uh, and a little farther down the coast, anywhere from three to five inches of rain. As far as the snow is concerned, remember I said it's those higher elevations, so we could see up to a foot, maybe a foot and a half, places like Crater, Crater Lake, Sun Valley could get some good snow as well as Yellowstone. Uh, that'll be something we'll have to watch. And elsewhere, a little you know farther to the southwest in United States, we're dealing with some mild highs it's actually quite warm across the midsection of the country. Um, considering it is early December, we'll see mid-50s across parts of the central plains, 70s across Texas. But we do have an Alberta clipper system that's going to work across the Great Lakes and into the mid-Atlantic. Uh, that'll bring us some light snow. It's a quick-moving system, hence the name there. It comes from Canada, so it will bring some chilly air. Mm -hmm. But some snow, some rain across that region, and otherwise some sunshine across the southeast with temperatures in the mid-60s, upper 60s, not bad. Welcome back. The director of the Miss Nicaragua beauty pageant is facing conspiracy charges over what's being called an alleged beauty queen coup. Resurfaced photos allegedly showed the newly crowned Miss Universe from Nicaragua protesting the repressive Ortega government just days after Nicaraguans celebrated her win. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett has the story. The new Miss Universe. An historic beauty pageant win, now overshadowed by her home country's claims of conspiracy and treason. Nicaragua! 23-year-old Chinese Palacios from Nicaragua was crowned Miss Universe, the first in her country to win the title. Her tears of excitement matched by those back home as Nicaraguans took to the streets to cheer her on. 
The country's leader, Daniel Ortega, joining the celebrations, calling the win a moment of, quote, legitimate joy and pride. But the exuberant mood quickly shifted after photos seemingly showing Palacios at 2018 protests against the dictator surfaced online. In 2018, those protests turned violent as the government tried to silence claims of Ortega's repressive rule. Human rights officials say 355 people were reported killed by government forces. Over the years, Ortega insists the protests were an attempted coup with foreign backing. Now, Nicaraguan police accusing the contest's local director, Karen Celiberti, and her family of rigging contests so anti-government winners would be elevated at pageants. The police criminally charging her and writing in a statement over the weekend that Celiberti promoted innocence in a conspiracy that has worked to convert the contest in political traps and ambushes financed by foreign agents adding that there is proof in phone records. Celeberti has not responded to NBC's request for comment, and Palacios has remained silent since her win. Since 2018, Ortega hardened his approach against anyone questioning his authority, arresting and expelling opponents, targeting religious leaders and the press, and stripping others of their citizenship. Thousands have fled in exile. Nicaraguans are largely forbidden to protest or carry the national flag in marches. But many took advantage of the Miss Universe win to take to the streets with the traditional blue and white flag rather than Ortega's black and red flag. Ortega hasn't directly responded, but of the celebrations, his wife and vice president wrote in a statement, let them stop manipulating the well-deserved triumphs of a pretty girl to hide their insignificance and inability. Well, that was Maura Barrett reporting. Well, as for Palacios, she's been in the U.S. since winning the pageant in neighboring El Salvador. She has not been charged with any crimes in Nicaragua. In Thailand, dozens of people are dead after a crash involving a double-decker bus. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga has the latest on that and other international news for us. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah, Joe, good morning. Well, that's right. At least 14 people have been killed and dozens more were injured in that bus crash early uh, this morning. Uh, local officials say the double-decker bus was traveling from Bangkok to a province in the deep south when the bus ran off the road and hit a tree. Police also say it's possible the driver who survived the accident might have fallen asleep at the wheel, but the investigation is still ongoing. Now to southern India, where Cyclone Mijaon has made landfall, battering the Andhra Pradesh state with heavy rains. According to the local weather office, winds are hitting up to about 70 miles per hour. Authorities evacuated thousands in preparations for this major storm, and so far at least nine people, including a child, have died. And right now, many residential areas are flooded. Parts of the state are expecting more than eight inches of rain over the next 24 hours. And we end this tour of the world in Canada with a police pursuit that the officers probably will not forget. A kangaroo escaped from its handlers in East Toronto while being transported to their new home. According to the park supervisor and head keeper, she leaped over handlers for a great escape during a rest stop at the Oshawa Zoo in Ontario. The female kangaroo spent a weekend in the wild before being captured, but she was not going down without a fight. Literally, she punched a police officer and it was a knockout. One of the officers on patrol said it was a moment he and his platoon mates will never forget. Well, after her uh, fight to the finish, the kangaroo and her mean right hook were safely captured. The Oshawa Zoo says she's in good health and hopefully we can say the same for the uh, policeman who was punched in the face. <laughs> and, you guys. and the kangaroo has already been signed to a reality TV contract. <laughs> <laughs> I read that fights. line this morning, <laughs> kangaroo punches off the I was like, yeah. it does sound like reality. There you go. Right. Claudia, thank you so thank much. Thank you. We're back now with our weekly mental health check, and we have tips on how to stay both physically and mentally fit during pregnancy. We're also going to talk about how to protect yourself against what's called secondhand sadness when supporting family and friends through difficult times. Let's bring in Dr. Robbie Ludwig for more on these headlines. She's a psychotherapist and an award-winning reporter. Good to have you with us. So, so let's start out with that pregnancy study. Researchers found exercise both during and after pregnancy can help prevent and treat postpartum hmm. depression. So walk us through wow. why that is and how women can spot the symptoms? So the studies are very significant, and what they found uh, was that women who exercise three to four times a week from breaking a sweat, a little aerobic, 35 to 45 minutes, actually bared 
better in terms of their emotional and physical well-being, in terms of feeling more emotionally stable, uh, getting better sleep, keeping their hormones in check. And this is really important because postpartum depression is greatly underdiagnosed and it can really impact the health of the mother and child. So typical symptoms, withdrawing from family and friends, feeling increased depression, anxiety, having a sense that you're not a good enough mom and having really uncomfortable thoughts and fantasies about you as a mother, either what you want to do to yourself or your child. We've also been talking a lot lately, this is when we've been teasing about these sad stories, either when you're helping out a family and friend through a tough time and that's sad, or of course, obviously, the news has been very heavy. That could all be yes. leading to what psychologists call secondhand sadness. Tell us how that works and what we can do to prevent it while still being there for those we love. Well, we are designed to plug into those around us, especially those we care about. And whenever you feel a sense of empathy or sympathy, that's really plugging into those around you and experiencing their emotional state. As therapists, we call this an emotional induction. And the way to protect yourself is to offer help. Most people feel like they need to fix. You don't need to fix. You just need to listen. You need to set boundaries and really understand yourself. If you feel that you're getting overwhelmed with emotions and it's not good for your mental health, take Take a break, ask, ask your friend or family members what you can do that you feel would be helpful. And those are really great starts to be available yet protect your emotions at the same mm. time. Good One more thing to talk about. Hey, remember how at the beginning of the year you made all those resolutions? How are those going no, for you I right don't. now? How are those going for you right now in December? So we're Bad. we're going to start thinking about that again with the new year mm. upon us. Many of us struggle sticking with them. So how can we actually create healthy habits that we're actually going to keep longer than a week or two? In <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's all about following the plan. And you want to think about what goals do you have for yourself that would make you a better person, turn you into the person you want to be. You have to get used to feeling uncomfortable as you're making new habits that are in your best interest. And it's really about sticking with the plan because many people rely on motivation, which really is not sustainable. Sustainable. Sometimes we'll feel motivated, sometimes we're not. So it's thinking about who you want to be, what do you need to do to get there, and following the plan no matter what, and allowing yourself to fail and then get back up and try again. That is the key. When you mm. get off track, sometimes you think, oh, I'm not going to do it. It's I'm okay. So you made a mistake. That. Get back. I'm like an all or nothing. But <laughs> if you're all, that doesn't last very long. It's tough. Yeah, it makes it tough. So all then right. I go to nothing. Some good advice, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, as always. Thanks for I joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Good morning. <laughs> and veterinarians across the U.S. are scrambling to treat the rising numbers of dogs getting sick with a severe type of respiratory illness. Well, as NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson reports, scientists are trying to figure out what's causing this outbreak break and how widespread it is. This is Maple. Seven-month-old Australian Shepherd Maple was a happy, healthy puppy until her owner, Adriana, noticed a cough. She's coughing pretty much every other minute. As Maple's cough grew even worse, Adriana panicked and rushed to the vet. I was really scared. Maple was sent home with antibiotics. The vet told Adriana the symptoms were likely caused by the mysterious respiratory illness plaguing dogs across the country. I would say that there's probably more that we don't know than what we know, which is frustrating. At Texas A&M College of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Kate Eicher began studying the illness after seeing a rash of cases in the spring, including her own puppy. What should dog owners be looking out for? Something like discharge with the eye, okay. a soft cough, like actually just what he just did. An online database shows dog owners are now reporting suspected cases in 37 states with at least a dozen deaths. The cause of the surge in cases, experts say, could include a new pathogen, low vaccination rates, or lower immunity levels after pandemic isolation. Dr. Eicher found one bacteria alone present in 75% of the severely ill dog she tested and in reviewing x-rays noticed a pattern. Are the patterns that we're seeing here important? They're really important.
A lot of the pattern or sort of the brightness that we would see wasn't in the spot where we would normally see it. It was occurring further back in the chest. Understanding the pattern, she says, could be key for vets to know what medication to prescribe. Treatment dog lovers may need to help their best friends. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, College Station, Texas. Let's stay on this and keep talking about dog safety and how we can keep our pets safe with Dr. Marianne Bailey. She's a veterinarian and the owner of Queenstown Veterinary Hospital and Western Shore Veterinary Hospital. Dr. Bailey, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. So we've been talking about this for a while now. We've seen this in dozens of states, as was just mentioned in Priscilla's piece. As doctors like yourself learn more, what are some of your concerns about this and are there specific areas that should be the most concerned? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. So it's definitely been something that since it began being talked about in the news, we think we're seeing more cases in our hospitals as well. And one of the biggest concerns is that we don't have a test to diagnose and say exactly what it is. And then with that, we don't know exactly how it's being spread, how to eliminate it from the environment or how to appropriately treat it. So right now, veterinarians are doing the best they can in treating this like we treat other respiratory diseases like Bordetella and influenza, mm. and then having to watch each dog's individual response and see how they respond and use that information to help us treat the next case that we might see come in. Prevention up front could be key. So what are some of the things we can do in advance to try and keep our four-legged friends safe from getting this illness in the first place? Yeah. So. Any respiratory disease is usually spread by water droplets that are released when a dog coughs. So if you have a dog that doesn't go very many places, your pet's probably at really low risk. But if you have a dog that goes to dog parks or doggy daycares or dog kennels, the first thing you can do is if your pet is coughing, don't take them. So it starts with you. Don't take your pet to places where there can be other dogs if they are coughing. But if you have the option of going to doggy daycare or keeping your pet home, Maybe right now while we're learning more about this, let's elect to keep them home. And if you have the option between a pet sitter or going to a boarding facility, keeping your pet home right now might be a better option while we're trying to find out more information about this, as well as seeing, is this something that's on the, the rise or is it going to start to die down, hopefully with time? Mm. Let's talk about the holiday season, though. I mean, not only is that a time when people often would need to board their dogs, let's say, but also even if you're not, you and your dog, your, you and your pets will be out visiting friends and family. What are some things dogs should avoid getting into or being near if they are kind of in a situation where there just simply are other dogs around and there's nothing you can do about it? Yeah, if you know you have to board your pet, go ahead and call the kennel that you were probably going to use and ask them, are you seeing signs of this? What are you doing to eliminate the spread? And what are you doing as far as vaccination protocols? That's something that you can do on your end to feel proactive. And also check with your veterinarian to make sure your pet is appropriately vaccinated for the things that we can try to prevent, like Bordetella, influenza, and para-influenza. Those vaccines will at least help decrease the severity of disease. Um, and then, you know, just tips for traveling with your pets, make sure you're prepared. You've got their vaccines, a collar with your phone number, and just understand, watch your pet. You know them the best. And if they are coughing, give your veterinarian a call on the earlier side and, and, and don't wait too long. Really good advice, especially as we do head into this holiday season. Dr. Marion Bailey, thank you so much. Welcome back. The music streaming service Spotify announced it's going to cut 1,500 jobs. That's around 17% of its workforce. This marks the company's third round of layoffs this year. Spotify CEO sent a memo to staff saying it took on too many employees in 2020 and in 2021 and needed to reduce costs. For more on this, we're joined by Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver. So Spotify stock actually closed higher on Monday after word about the layoffs. What should we know about these job cuts and the response to it, really? Yeah, this is kind of a pattern now we're seeing with some big tech companies. Already this year, we've had about 250,000 layoffs. Hard to, hard to realize that when we've had a lot of job gains in other sectors, but we're talking about Meta, we're talking about Amazon, some big companies laying off people. Spotify trying to right-size, saying, the CEO saying, the economy has slowed and the cost of money is more expensive. That's those higher interest rates. Borrowing costs are higher. Spotify has promised profitability next year, but it is trying to get there. It's just not getting there because maybe subscriber growth is slowing a little bit, ad revenue is slowing a little bit. So this is 
an acceleration to profitability, and that's why the stock went up yesterday. I think a lot of times when you hear about layoffs of this scale and the third time this year, it's like, okay, is the company not doing well? So how successful is Spotify, especially compared to other popular services like Apple Music, things like that? Is their business model working? They have a pretty good business model, but they do pay a lot for content. They paid over a billion dollars. They got the Joe Rogan experience there mm -hmm. now. They bought the Ringer. They've been spending a lot of money and spent a lot over the past few years and hired a lot of people to support that. But now the CEO, Daniel X, saying we got too many people working around work and working around working around work so no one is actually focused on the core mission, which is help its users, right, help its artists, and then make a big profit because investors want companies that have good cash flow. Spotify has been trying to get there for years. So, I mean, speaking of profit, I mean, the company reported a profit more than $70 million in the third quarter, right? So does that make this a surprising decision to do the layoffs? A little bit. It's also changing its business model a little bit. It's going to pay. Mm -hmm. It has a higher threshold now. If you're an artist that puts music on Spotify before you start getting paid, the threshold's higher. The big artists like Beyonce and Taylor, they make hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars from Spotify. Smaller artists don't. So the model is good. It's got a lot of subscribers, just not a lot of paying subscribers. Subscribers got half of its uh, users are paying subscribers. It wants to accelerate that, and this is a move to do that. Right size the company, slim it down, and in improve those profit margins. What do you think this says just about where we're at in the future of the tech industry of streaming platforms? Companies have realized they're a little too bloated. They took on too much staff during the pandemic, and especially in 2021 coming out of it. They want to get smaller and they want better profit margins. Why? So their shareholders will bid up their stock price. This is about raising the stock price and making its investors happy, but also trying to build a more sustainable business that can last for decades. All right. Caleb Silver, thank you so much. Thanks, Caleb. Well, let's stick with money news. A breach over at genetic testing company 23andMe is impacting the personal data of millions of users. CNBC's Silvana Hanau has that and other headlines that could affect your wallet. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning. Yeah, so 23andMe confirms hackers access data from 6.9 million people. That's about half of its 14 million customers. The company says files from its DNA relatives feature were exposed in the breach, which was first reported in October. Now, a spokesperson says hackers were likely able to access accounts in cases where users recycled their logins. That means their username and password were the same as those on other sites that were previously hacked. Tesla is warning the Model 3 is about to lose half of its federal tax credit. Currently, the credit, which is funded through the Inflation Reduction Act, can shave up to $7,500 off the price of the Model 3. But that will drop to $3,750 next month for the rear-wheel drive and long-range versions. The Model 3 is Tesla's most affordable electric vehicle, starting at about $36,000. And the reason for the cut? Well, Tesla may be unable to meet U.S. government requirements on where it sources parts for its cars. And money may actually be able to buy happiness. A recent survey by Empower shows millennials believe they need a salary of $525,000 to achieve financial happiness. Now, that's nearly triple that of Gen Xers. Millennials are in the prime age for several major financial decisions right now, such as buying a home or having children. Now, those in the survey define happiness in several ways, including paying bills on time, living debt free, being able to afford everyday luxuries without worry and owning a home, guys. How about that? Uh, this video is hilarious. I, <laughs> I think that, that's what it says, right? Every week I get my paycheck. That's me. Just <laughs> make snow angels in the money. Yeah. Shoot your gun. A money <laughs> gun oh. is kind of cool. Ooh, that that sounds sounds cool. like that would make wow. me happy, actually. Right. Me too. I'd be very happy off. with that. Oh, we so just put that on a loop for an hour. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> you got it. Welcome back. Beyonce and Taylor Swift have a lot in common from their own very successful world tours that turned into two very successful movies. Well, now their songs could maybe even help save some lives. The American Heart Association has an updated list of handy tunes that help with performing CPR. Of course, you might know the most popular one is the BG song, Staying Alive, but... Heart Association says the tempo from T Swift songs like You're Losing Me and Sparks Fly, as well as Beyonce's Virgo Groove and Break My Soul, I think that might be my favorite one of these, match the ideal CPR chest compression rate. Yeah, I guess they are all kind of the same. I just went through them, each of those songs you said in my head. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. works out. All right, Savannah, are we going to the troll hole now? <laughs>
Can you just come back here in. so you can read we're this? Because I don't like saying it. Okay, then this hour, we are paying a visit to a museum truly unlike any other. The story behind a record-setting collection of trolls that all began with one doll for Christmas. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch takes us to the troll hole. <laughs> You've probably seen their wacky hair, wide eyes, and smirking faces. But even if you're familiar with these pint-sized iconic trolls, odds are you've never seen this many under one roof. This room is probably the most densely populated troll community on planet Earth. I would agree with that, yes. Welcome to the Troll Hole in Alliance, Ohio, home to the Guinness World Record for the largest collection of trolls, officially 8,130. Owner Sherry Groom says even if two trolls look the same, at least one feature has to be different to count. So pretty much everything we're seeing is unique in some way. Sometimes the eyes, sometimes the hair color. And sometimes the unexpected. Is that a Playboy bunny? That is Playboy. Is it fair to say for you at this point that trolls are an obsession? Yes, I'm obsessed about trolls. I'm paranoid someone has more than me, and I'm grandiose that I'm a troll queen. Groom's passion dates back to childhood. I'll start it with that right there. There was my very first troll doll that I got when I was five years old for Christmas. Something about the trolls in the folk and the fairy tales, and then the dolls represented that. So it wasn't just like a Barbie or a Cabbage Patch. The trolls had a history. Eventually, Groom wound up buying in bulk. I had a row of trolls in a shelf, and then it became a whole room. And once it became a whole room, I'm like, mm, do you need any more trolls? Look at that. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle trolls, skateboarding trolls. But this place is about way more than just all of these dolls. They've got backpacks and T-shirts and towels and a sleeping bag. This place is all trolls. Including other dolls that might not look so familiar. Groom says everything adds up to around 40,000 pieces, making Alliance Ohio home to more troll memorabilia than people. You will feel the energy of the happy-go-lucky trolls in the museum. It's a happy place. Groom says each year, this happy place draws about 2,500 visitors from around the world. Guests put pins here. You can see Ohio's very densely filled out, but you can see the different countries up there. Finland, Sweden, Japan, China, Australia, India, Iran, Afghanistan. All visiting this small town about 60 miles outside Cleveland. You just got married. We did. <laughs> Why did this have to be part of the honeymoon? We saw it and thought that we would be remiss to miss the opportunity to come see the giant collection of troll dolls. Absolutely. It's insane. It's overwhelming. It's, it's, it's so much. It's so cool. How many times have you been here? Uh, eight been here eight times yes what keeps bringing you back i host exchange students and always looking for something unique to show them here in america come on guys it's time and now with trolls dancing across the silver screen Groom says another generation of kids is joining the troll fan club how much of a bump did huge. the popularity go huge huge popularity because you have three generations that love trolls from the 60s the 80s and again now. Why is this something people should see with their own eyes in person? So this is the only place in the world with this pile of trolls. It defies explanation. You can't explain this to anyone until you actually come here and physically feel it. <laughs> okay, that was right. a terrifying way to end that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jesse. We should mention the Trolls movies are made by NBC's parent company. You're planning a visit. Yeah, so gosh, yes, I can't wait. It's already <laughs> booked. <laughs> Troll hole. <laughs> it does for this hour. <laughs> of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, Israel launches new attacks in southern Gaza. The military ordering hundreds of thousands to evacuate again. And with the Egyptian border overcrowded and sealed off, many are trapped as the fighting intensifies. We'll have the latest on the ground. Debate countdown. The fourth Republican primary debate now a day away in the field of contenders is shrinking. Only four candidates are set to take the stage. And former President Trump, once again, is not one of them. As Trump's opponents sharpen their attacks, there's a new warning 
from former Republican leader Liz Cheney, what she says will be the consequences of another Trump presidency. Plus, a home becomes a fireball rocking a Virginia neighborhood. You can see the blast flattening that house and sending debris high into the air. What we've learned about the investigation and what police believe set off the whole thing. And medications like Ozempic and Wagovi are finding new popularity as weight loss drugs, but a new study says they could offer another potential benefit. We're digging into the research claiming they could help reduce alcohol consumption. Hmm. Dive into that research a little bit later. Keep finding out new things about these drugs. Really exactly. Interesting. All hmm. right. This morning, Israel is stepping up its assault on southern Gaza, vowing that its offensive there will be just as intense as what it carried out in the north. Israel is now ordering Palestinians to move even further south toward the border with Egypt, but UN agencies and aid groups are warning that nowhere is safe for Gaza's 1.8 million displaced people. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has more. The UN says that Israel's offensive in Gaza is leaving Palestinians with few safe places to go. The UN's humanitarian chief put it bluntly, saying that every time we think things can't get more apocalyptic, they do. The Israeli military this morning is launching more attacks in southern Gaza and ordering hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who live in the city of Han Yunis or were displaced there to move even further south. The chief of staff of the Israeli military says the operations in southern Gaza will be just as intense, just as powerful as what northern Gaza has seen so far. After the deadly massacre by Hamas, Israel began its war two months ago, attacking in northern Gaza. It ordered Palestinians at the time to move south. Han Yunus, now under attack, is in the south. The only place left to go is Rafah, right on the Egyptian border. This is Rafah now massively overcrowded with not nearly enough food or places to sleep no fresh water and a high risk of disease where are we supposed to go from here into the sea asked this man many palestinians believe israel's real mission is to destroy hamas and expel palestinians from gaza the egyptian government suspects the same and has sealed the border leaving palestinians penned in shuffled from place to place and under attack Israel says it's doing all it can to avoid civilian casualties, that the evacuation orders are designed to keep Palestinians out of the line of fire as it attacks Hamas fighters and leaders who move south to hide among the civilian population. We're pursuing Hamas wherever Hamas is hiding. Our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. In Israel, the war against Hamas is broadly popular considered by many to be the only response after Hamas killed more than 1,200 Israelis and kidnapped more than 240 hostages. Hamas is still holding more than 130 hostages. The United States saying on Monday the group is refusing to turn over all of the women hostages and is calling for an investigation into reports Hamas used rape as a weapon of war. Is they don't want those women to be able to talk about what happened to them during their time in custody. The Israeli military says that its soldiers are making progress in Gaza and that so far it has located 800 Hamas tunnel shafts and blown up 500 of them. All right, Richard, thank you. Well, as we just mentioned a little bit in that piece there, Israel is accusing the United Nations of failing to respond to reports of widespread sexual violence used by Hamas during the October 7th attack, especially at that Nova rave party. Officials say they've collected evidence from witnesses and first responders that detail alleged accounts of rapes, mutilations, and torture. Several prominent leaders and activists spoke on a panel at the United Nations, including former Meta Platform COO Sheryl Sandberg. Here's some of what she had to say. The world has to decide who to believe. Do we believe the Hamas spokesperson who said that rape is forbidden, therefore it couldn't have possibly happened on October 7th? Or do we believe the women whose bodies tell us how they spent the last minutes of their lives? We call upon the entire UN to formally condemn Hamas for these rapes, make sure there is a full and fair investigation and hold the terrorists accountable. 
NBC's Anna Schechter joins us now for more. She's a senior producer in our investigative unit. Anna, good morning. So much of this just so disturbing. Tell us some of the evidence that was presented and how systemic they say this alleged abuse was, especially in some of those neighborhoods and at the music festival, as we mentioned. Thanks so much, Savannah. There are different categories of evidence. So you have eyewitness accounts from that festival where people played dead and mm -hmm. witnessed rape, in one case a gang rape where a woman was passed from one Hamas militant to another and then shot in the head. Then there are the bodies of the women. The issue with this investigation, it's so difficult to uh, undertake this investigation. It's not like a regular CSI crime scene where you can easily do a, C you know, a rape kit. The, m the massive amount of bodies that had to be collected that were in such um, traumatized shape, mutilated. Um, it's really hard to even put a number on it, but I've spoken directly with multiple first responders who witnessed women who had been shot in the genital area, shot in the breast, had their breasts cut off, um, even much worse. I, I don't even want to say mm -hmm. out loud um, what they witnessed. And um, they are still collecting evidence. So this investigation is probably going to go on for many months to come. But the women's bodies, one person who was preparing the women's bodies for burial, she was um, on a team of people trying to identify the bodies because so many of their faces had been shot off and they were not identifiable and they had to do these DNA tests. She said, you know, the, bo the women's bodies told a story and she get strength, even though what she experienced was so traumatic, going through countless bodies who were mutilated. Um, and she says that telling the story and speaking out, and she also spoke at the UN yesterday. We're, these are such incredible, difficult details to hear. We're hearing from women at the UN, Sheryl Sandberg included. What is the main messaging coming from these women rights groups and global leaders? And do they feel this is being ignored? Well, the Israeli uh, feminist groups and academics who have um, started a coalition to document, um, just for historical record, every instance of reported sexual violence against women, they found these international organizations in the past to be their colleagues to help them. They, they're sort of building this system in Israel where rape is prosecuted and women are believed. And when there were several weeks of silence from the international aid community, they really they told me that they felt very alone. So last week, UN Women did put out a statement condemning the Hamas attack. But for some of the women, who are part of this coalition and who are now coming to the UN to tell the story, it felt to them what they told me is too little too late. Mm. So quickly tell us what happens next year. Does the UN have power to investigate or do anything about these allegations? So they are calling for a full investigation and Israel is doing its own investigation. I think that's the priority for the people that who are directly involved with the Israeli investigation that I've been talking mm. to. Um, and I think there is hesitation on that front to um, trust the UN to do their own investigation, although you heard Sheryl Sandberg calling for a full UN uh, investigation and the international community to do an investigation. Anna Schechter, thank you so much. Really difficult to hear those details, but important that we keep uh, shining a light on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. This morning, the presidents of three of the country's most prominent universities will appear before Congress to address growing anti-Semitism on college campuses. This mirrors a larger problem across the country. Nationally, there were 312 anti-Semitic incidents reported across the United States in the two weeks following the start of the Israel-Hamas war. That's up from 64 incidents during the same period last year. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us with more. So, Ryan, what is it congressional leaders are hoping to accomplish at today's hearing? Well, Joe, more than anything, this is going to be an opportunity for them to put these college presidents on notice. Uh, a lot of times these congressional hearings serve more as a bully pulpit to allow congressional leaders to, to raise concerns 
uh, with people that are directly involved with controversial issues. And this is apparently one of them. Uh, you know, these college presidents all come from universities where there have been very specific examples uh, of anti-Semitic threats and, and potential violence. Uh, and in many cases, uh, students have said that they feel threatened. So uh, what you're going to see here today is these congressional leaders press uh, these presidents about what they're doing to curb the threat of anti-Semitism, what they're doing to uh, protect their students, and then perhaps even uh, offer some veiled threats as to what Congress could, could do next if things aren't changed in the very near future, Joe. So, Ryan, who has been called to testify, and do we know why they were the ones chosen? Yeah, so it's the college presidents uh, from three prominent universities, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Harvard. And all three of these schools have dealt with very specific incidents of anti-Semitism. Uh, for instance, at Penn uh, in Philadelphia, there was a situation where anti-Semitic slogans uh, were uh, posted on some of the college uh, campus buildings. Uh, there was also a threat uh, where members of the college community uh, that were Jewish were getting uh, very very uh, specific threats through email uh, that raised uh, a number of concerns. At MIT, there was a situation where Jewish students uh, were trapped because uh, of a, a, a protest uh, where they felt very threatened. So uh, these are all colleges where these incidents uh, seem to be happening on a more frequent basis. And these three presidents in particular were under fire for not specifically addressing it as quickly as some, including donors, members of Congress and others, uh, felt that they should do uh, as quickly as they ultimately did. Now, I should point out that all three of these uh, presidents have said that they're happy to come and, and talk about what they're doing. They have started uh, to address this in a very specific way. Whether or not that's going to satisfy congressional leaders remains to be seen. And then the question is, well, what does Congress hope to do with this to try and fight anti-Semitism on university campuses? What power does Congress have when it comes to this? Yeah, Joe, I mean, I think that's a very important point in all of this. I mean, they've made some veiled threats. They've talked about perhaps uh, withholding any type of federal funding that these institutions get. These three institutions in particular are all private colleges. Uh, but then there's also the possibility that they could attempt to threaten their tax-exempt status. The idea that they'd, they'd be able to push that type of legislation through, I think, really is somewhat of a fantasy. So this is really just Congress uh, using their public uh, powers of persuasion to try and force these colleges to do things differently. I should also point out the Democrats are, are going to use this opportunity to also raise uh, the, the situations uh, related to the rising threats uh, of Islamophobia and also the threats against Palestinian uh, college students as well. We saw those three Palestinian college students in Burlington, Vermont, uh, that were attacked. So this is going to be something that isn't just necessarily anti-Semitism, but the rise in rhetoric as a result of what's happening in the Middle East uh, that Congress believe needs to be addressed. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Well, there's more reaction this morning to former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney's comments that she doesn't think Donald Trump would leave office if he's elected to a second term as president. Those words are becoming a hot topic ahead of tomorrow night's presidential debate. NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson has the details. Hey there, good morning. It is set to be the smallest debate stage yet tomorrow night in Alabama. Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, and Chris Christie, who's been relentless in his attacks on former President Trump. But it's another one of Mr. Trump's critics who is drawing his attention today as he blasts Congresswoman Liz Cheney for her warnings about how dangerous she thinks his reelection could be. Former President Donald Trump now lashing out at one of his toughest GOP critics as former Congresswoman Liz Cheney sounds the alarm in her new book and in an interview with Savannah about Mr. Trump's run for office. You've said we are sort of sleepwalking into dictatorship in the United States. Dictatorship. Is that what we would have if we re-elect Donald Trump? I think it's, it's a very, very real threat and concern. Cheney revealing the danger she thinks Donald Trump would pose if he wins the White House again. Do you believe if Donald Trump were elected next year that he would try to stay in office beyond a second term? I that he would never leave office? There's no question. There's you think no he would question. try to stay in power forever? I, absolutely. I mean, he's already done it once. He said he will do it again. He's expressed no remorse for what he did. On his social media platform, Mr. Trump accusing Cheney of having Trump derangement syndrome. But Cheney's not the only one concerned, with fears growing as Mr. Trump, fighting multiple legal battles, promises to target his enemies. I am your retribution. I am your retribution. If I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say, 
go down and indict them. On Veterans Day, we pledge to you that we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. That last remark drawing broad condemnation with President Biden comparing it to language used in Nazi Germany. Mr. Trump leading the Republican field far and away in polls with his opponents hoping to try to catch up at tomorrow night's Republican debate. Mr. Trump set to skip again. As for former Congresswoman Cheney, she also warned that if Mr. Trump wins, it could be the last election Americans ever get to vote in. Now on the campaign trail, we're seeing the former president try to flip the script to a degree and accuse President Biden of being the one who's a danger to democracy. That's despite Mr. Trump, of course, and his attempts to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election. Back to you. All right, Hallie Jackson, thank you. Police in Philadelphia are investigating a fatal stabbing at a Macy's department store there. Authorities say one security guard was killed, another was injured after an attempted shoplifting. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk joins us now from Philadelphia with more on this. Stephanie, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. You know, this Macy's here in downtown Philadelphia is really a holiday highlight, especially its annual light show. But sadly, today, it is also a crime scene after police say a shoplifter attacked two unarmed security guards with a knife. This morning, the Macy's in downtown Philadelphia is marked with yellow crime scene tape. Police investigating a deadly double stabbing they say happened Monday after two unarmed security guards stopped a would-be shoplifter. The security here backs off, gets the merchandise back, allows the mail to go on. But about 10 minutes later, police say the man returned to the store and stabbed one of the guards and then the other after he tried to help. The suspect who fled on a subway was later arrested at a station a few stops away. Both security guards were taken to the hospital where one died from his injuries. This started as a retail theft, um, upgraded obviously to a, a robbery, um, and then led ultimately to a homicide. And so uh, again, it's just a tragic situation. According to Philadelphia police, this Macy's store is a hotbed of shoplifting, with over 250 reported retail thefts so far this year. In a statement to NBC News, Macy says it is heartbroken about the incident, adding ensuring the safety and well-being of customers and colleagues is always our top priority. The deadly incident comes as retail crimes have been getting a lot of attention nationwide. Though there's conflicting data on nationwide shoplifting, it is up in some major cities, including New York and Los Angeles, where a flash mob recently stole $12,000 worth of apparel from a Nike store. In Philadelphia, police say there has been an uptick in property theft this year, including shoplifting. Now one of the city's most popular department stores has also become the scene of a violent crime. The mayor of Philadelphia says he's horrified by the crime that took place here at this May season. He's praying for the families of those security guards. Their identities as well as the suspect's identity have yet to be revealed. Joe, back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Well, now to a massive house explosion last night in Arlington, Virginia, the normally quiet suburb just outside of the Beltway in Washington, D.C. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello joins us now from there with the latest on this. Wow, hey, Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. So we are in the Ballston area of Arlington, Virginia, and police have now cordoned off several blocks around this house. Uh, this was just a massive explosion, as you saw. Police were on the scene of this house because they had been called for somebody who was allegedly firing some sort of a flare gun. And when they approached the house at 8 o'clock at night, suddenly it went up in a massive ball of flame. The massive explosion was caught on camera, literally blowing a home to pieces in Arlington, Virginia. We need all fire apparatus so we can get the house that's exploded, I believe. I was laying in my bed and then just it felt like we got attacked. Police were already at the scene moments before the blast. Officers were trying to access the property and execute a search warrant. A SWAT team had responded to the home hours earlier after receiving reports of shots fired. Officers determined that someone inside had actually discharged a flare gun 30 to 40 times. As officers attempted to execute that search warrant this evening, the suspect inside the residence uh, discharged several rounds. The house subsequently exploded. 
The explosion rocked the entire surrounding area. Virginia State House delegate Patrick Hope writing, My family and I are fine, but our house shook and we could see the flames from our front yard. Police believe the suspect was alone inside the home when the blast occurred. They have not been able to determine if the home was blown up on purpose. Authorities also indicate they did not have immediate information about any prior incidents at the house. But neighbors described the man living there as a character who covered his windows with tin foil. This morning, residents nearby are grateful to be safe after a terrifying night. Just scary to think that this is happening around us and it could happen in what I thought was like a safe community. Yeah, so this area here is still cordoned off. There's a fire station literally a block away, and so the fire department was on the scene literally within seconds. Amazingly, you saw the police that were right there, uh, right in the front yard. Mm -hmm. No police officers were injured when this house exploded. The suspect remains unaccounted for, and we still don't have a firm ID on him. Savannah, back to you. Oh, incredible video. Tom Costello, thank you so much. A wintry mix of rain and snow headed for the Great Lakes. Let's get to that in more in your morning news now weather. Angie Lassman is back with us. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. We're going to talk about that Alberta Clipper system, that fast-moving system that's going to move through the Great Lakes through the day today. And yes, bring us a little bit of snow and some rain as well. Big picture look elsewhere across the country, some warm conditions across the middle of the country, mild highs for the southwest, and some heavy rain that we're going to watch through the, at least the extended period well into the weekend for portions of the Pacific Northwest. But let's talk about the snow that I mentioned for the Great Lakes and eventually into the Mid-Atlantic and the Appalachians will pick up on some snow as well. Here's that system through the day today. Not impressive amounts of snow by any means, but impactful in some ways. We'll leave you with some slick roads in some spots and that uh, will eventually spread from the Midwest through the Mid-Atlantic as we get into the later parts of today. So here's the, here's the deal by tomorrow. Most of that will kind of start to taper off, but we'll still deal with a little bit of those scattered showers, uh, snow showers, I should say, and maybe even some windy conditions and some chilly conditions on the back side of that as well. As far as the snow totals are concerned, where you see the white, that's about an inch, but we could see some higher amounts, especially across West Virginia, where up to six inches of snow is possible. Those will leave us with, of course, some slick roads, so a heads up for that if you live in that region. Now, the Northwest, that's where over the next few days we're going to have multiple rounds of storms moving through, and because of that, we already have some saturated grounds and more rain on the way. Those flood alerts are up, and they include nine million people from Spokane to Port Portland, Eugene, down into portions of Northern California too. Here's the first system that we're watching today and into tomorrow. Atmospheric River bringing us some heavy rain um, that's going to stretch mainly across Washington and Oregon today. We'll see some, this is a pretty warm system, so we're going to see a, a lot of melting snow where rain is falling over that already uh, initiated snowpack. So the flooding concerns, the mudslides, all of that, especially river flooding is going to be something we'll watch for. Tomorrow it moves a little farther into portions of California, so we'll pick up on some snow and some rain for folks there. And not to mention some gusty winds, too. We'll see gusts maybe 30, 40 miles per hour. Um, so that'll be something to watch as well. Now, the snow fall totals aren't all that impressive, but rain is pretty good. We'll see three to six inches for the Cascades, a little closer to the coast for Washington and Oregon, up to eight inches, and the northern California coast, um, anywhere from three to five inches. So some flooding concerns definitely for folks there. Now, to the good news, warm temperatures across the middle of the country. We've got Denver sitting at 60 degrees later this afternoon, running 10, 15 degrees above normal in a lot of these spots. Even Reno headed to the low 60s, Oklahoma City 57 degrees. That warmth spreads a little farther to the east for tomorrow. Mid 60s for Rapid City. That doesn't feel like December oh, in Rapid yeah. City for sure. 55 for Omaha. Dodge City hits 66 tomorrow. And then guys, if you're looking for some warm air into the end of the work week and into the weekend, even mm -hmm. as far uh, east as the northeast, we're going to see temperatures in the 50s here in New York. Welcome back. It's a story that has rattled Washington. A former U.S. ambassador has been charged with spying for Cuba. Victor Manuel Roca was arrested on Friday following a year-long FBI sting operation. He appeared in court yesterday. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney joined us now. So Ken, first tell us a little bit more about the man, the work he was doing, what kind of sensitive information he'd have mm -hmm. access to, and then how he was caught in the end. 
Good morning, Joe and Savannah. Rocha spent his life as a diplomat reaching to some of the highest levels of the U.S. government. He joined the State Department in 1981, and this criminal complaint says he was working for Cuba even at that time. He rose to the ranks of a U.S. ambassador to Bolivia. Before that, he worked at the National Security Council in the White House. Uh, during various times, he was in charge of Cuban affairs. In all these jobs, he would have had access to very sensitive information. U.S. ambassadors are briefed on CIA operations and the identities of American spies in their country. So really sensitive stuff. The, the criminal complaint does not detail what, if any, information he provided to Cuba. But what it says is that he was working for Cuban intelligence the whole time. He was essentially a sleeper agent who came to the United States and joined up with the Cubans. And his whole uh, raison d'etre was to support the Cuban revolution. And the reason they know that is because they sent an undercover FBI operative to go talk to him, posing as a Cuban handler. And according to the criminal complaint, he essentially confessed all of that to this person. Um, so it's not clear how the FBI learned about him in the first place, uh, but now they have these statements and they continue to investigate. And Ken, what happened in court yesterday and what exactly is he being charged with? Yeah, he's being charged not with espionage, interestingly, uh, because to prove espionage, you have to show that he provided national defense information to the government. They either don't have that evidence or they're not prepared to present it. He's being charged with acting as an unregistered foreign agent and conspiring to do that. Uh, that, that charge carries a penalty of 10 years or more in prison. In court, uh, you know, he was in a prison jumpsuit. He, he broke into tears at one point. His wife was there. Uh, it's all sort of coming uh, home to roost for this man who spent a life of prosperity in the United States. And quickly, Ken, what happens next in the case? And if he's found guilty, what could the punishment be? So, yeah, he, he could face a major prison term. But the real thing that the U.S. government would like him to do is cooperate and tell them exactly what he gave the Cubans over the years. And they'd probably be willing to make a deal. He's 73 years old. So prison sentence isn't the most important thing here. The U.S. government needs to know what the damage was from this incredible penetration of its inner circle, guys. All right. Kendall Anian, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, more international headlines now in Germany. Freezing rain and cold weather are causing major problems at Munich Airport. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavaga has that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Joseph Allen, good morning. Well, that's right. This morning at Munich Airport, all flights were either cancelled or postponed due to freezing rain. Now, a, web, a, a statement posted uh, on the airport's website says that operating areas will be de-iced for the first half of the day, but also that it can be assumed that the majority of flights will also have to be cancelled for the rest of the day for safety reasons. In the past few days, southern Germany has been experiencing a wave of, se of severe weather conditions, including heavy snowfalls that have affected public transport. Let's go to Indonesia now, for where the official death toll from the eruption of Mount Marapi has risen to 23. On Sunday, tens of climbers were caught by surprise by the powerful eruption. More than 50 of them were rescued, but many others lost their lives. Now local officials say they recovered five bodies, while another 18 people are presumed dead because they were very close to the eruption of hot gases and ash. The rescue operation is made difficult by bad weather and the difficult slopes of Mount Marapi. And let's send this tour of the world in Rovaniemi, Finland, where there is a very special house, Santa's Cabin. Now, Airbnb is inviting one family to spend three days there and live like elves. It will be free, but comes with some commitments. The family can volunteer to work in Santa's post office nearby and help Santa's elves to manage the 30,000 letters he receives every day. Now, Airbnb said the lucky family will also dine on Finnish meals, go on awe-inspiring adventures and wear elf clothing. Now, guys, I don't know about you, it all sounds amazing, but wearing elf clo clothing, it will maybe a bit of a put off for me. Yeah, a lot of that. <laughs> lots, but... of, lots of elves and trolls in the news this morning. <laughs> I don't want to sort the mail either, but that's cute. All right, <laughs> Claudia, thank you. Welcome back. Well, local police report an American woman has been killed in a shark attack while on vacation in the Bahamas. The tourist from Boston was attacked while paddle boarding near the resort where she was staying. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has the latest. Sam, good morning. Well, we've reported on shark attacks frequently, but rarely are they deadly and rarely in the month of December. But this instance in Nassau was the worst case scenario. The victim was paddle boarding with a male relative about three quarters of a mile from shore when, according to police, she was attacked, and by the time lifeguards could get to her, it was too late. 
Tragedy in paradise, overwhelming a popular Caribbean resort. This boat returning to shore carrying a 44-year-old woman from Boston, bitten by a shark while paddleboarding off the beach with a male relative. She suffered serious injuries to the right side of her body, including the right hip region and also her right upper limb. Police say a lifeguard from the popular Sandals Resort responded in a rescue boat, getting the pair out of the water and administering CPR as they came back. But the woman didn't survive. Sandals Resort's writing, we wish to express our heartfelt condolences to the guest's family and loved ones. The shocking sequence, the second fatal shark attack in about 48 hours, following this horrific scene on Malake Beach on Mexico's Pacific Coast, where eyewitness videos show a woman being pulled from the water, her leg apparently severed. A local official telling the Associated Press the 26-year-old mother was bitten while swimming with her child near a floating play structure like this, moving her daughter to safety before the shark came for her. Still, unprovoked shark bites are quite rare, and fatal attacks even more so. The international shark attack file noting five deaths in all of 2022. The Bahamas, though, has now experienced two shark-related deaths and another presumed fatality in just over a year. In most cases, it seems to be mistaken identity where the human just happens to be unfortunate enough to be swimming or in the water in a place where the shark was feeding on something else. But some swimmers say they're not deterred. I'm here to enjoy the water, so I'm going to jump in. A modern island paradise coexisting with the threat of an ancient predator. And when it comes to the rate of shark attacks, it turns out that's been pretty steady over the course of decades. The main difference right now is the population has grown, meaning there are just simply more people in the water. Back to you. All right, Sam, thank you. Well, there have been lots of stories and also studies on how many people have seen success managing their weight with popular drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi. But a new study now shows that they may also be helpful when it comes to treating addiction. According to a case series published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, semiglutide, the active ingredient in both Ozempic and Wagovi, has, quote, shown promise in preclinical studies for reducing alcohol consumption. And joining us now for more on this is NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. Dr. Patel, good morning. So it seems like we keep on learning more and more about these drugs. A lot of it sounding like good news. So take us through this case first. What is alcohol use disorder? And then how do drugs like these help people reduce their drinking? Yeah, Savannah Joe, alcohol use disorder is a spectrum. Everything including binge drinking, kind of occasional drinking that results in not being able to remember, having blackout periods, some intoxication, all the way to complete kind of dependence on alcohol. So what we would consider kind of alcoholism is what previously this would be known as, but alcohol use disorder, all of that spectrum. Symptoms include everything that I just mentioned, including withdrawal symptoms. So that if you don't get alcohol at certain periods of time, your body physically just goes into withdrawal. Treatment generally has ranged previously from kind of cognitive behavioral therapy, psychology, psychotherapy, psychiatry interventions, and then some sedation, and then treating the withdrawal effect. We haven't had any really great ability to treat people with alcohol use disorder. This is a promising case series. It's just a case series. It's not kind of a, you know, a well-done trial, but it gives us a lot of hope, and it builds on several decades of research that drugs like semiglutide and its precursors can be helpful. So important to keep in mind. I mean, alcohol use disorder isn't something that can be cured. Uh, so would a person, does it right. seem, have to remain on these drugs? Mm -hmm to manage their symptoms? Yeah, it's a great question, Joe. And and look, I, I, when I have diabetics who I put on semiglutide and drugs like semiglutide, terzepatide, and some of the other ones that we've been talking about, Manjaro, I do tell people you'll probably need to be on this the rest of your life. You need to be okay with it. But I also had people on diabetes drugs like insulin for the rest of their lives because of the same factors. So with alcohol use disorder, we see some of that similar parallel where we might need to have them on. But I think that's where some of these trials could be really important, that if you can curb some of that kind of uh, binge kind of drinking, and if you can curb some of that craving that people have, just like they do for food and semi-glutide, then this could be a promising new treatment that you could initiate early, that we don't need to wait until people become so physically dependent that they go into withdrawal, that as early signs of binge drinking occur, we might be able to initiate this drug. Right now, to be clear, this is not a drug that is indicated by the FDA for alcohol use disorder. This is just a signal that we're seeing in trials, but it's a promising signal and one that I know researchers are going to follow up on. You know, because these drugs are so new, it kind of feels like we're learning about them in, in real time, oh, and that includes some of the side effects. Right. What long-term effects could people right. taking this drug have, even if it is for alcohol use disorder? Yeah, so the long-term effects are kind of the similar ones that we've been warning diabetics. And you're right, Joe, this is 
such a new drug in a way, but the class of drugs that it's in, that GLP-1 glucagon-like peptide agonists, those drugs we've had around for a couple of decades and we haven't seen any long-term effects that are really kind of problematic. We do have those case studies. We've talked about it here on the show with kind of the GI effects. Some of those can be unfortunately fatal. So that's why when people are taking these drugs, if they do see some of these side effects, GI drug side effects, any of the other ones that you could see in any use of these drugs, that you should just signal that to the doctor. We get blood work, we check you out, and we decide if that's something we need to decrease or stop the drug altogether. But so far, nothing significant. Fascinating as we keep learning more about these, how they're impacting our economy, the world around us, and of course, everybody's health. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you so much. We're back now with financial headlines, starting with a new push from Johnson & Johnson to settle an ongoing lawsuit alleging their baby powder is linked to cancer. CNBC's Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so Johnson & Johnson is pushing to resolve lawsuits claiming its talc-based baby powder causes cancer. The company is looking to avoid going to trial next year, and Bloomberg reports a group of law firms have reached agreements to settle about 100 cases. Now, the terms of the settlements are being kept private, but J&J could discuss them at an investor presentation later today, and the company is trying to resolve all current and future baby powder cases after a judge rejected a $9 billion settlement. A new study finds ChatGPT is giving wrong or incomplete answers to questions about drugs. The survey by the pharmacy school at Long Island University shows nearly 75% of responses were inaccurate. Researchers challenged the free version of ChatGPT with real questions posed to the school's drug information service over the past two years. Now, when asked to cite references, the AI bot generated fake citations to support some answers. LIU says doctors and patients should be cautious about using ChatGPT as an authoritative source for healthcare information. And China's space ambitions may be back on track. One of the country's leading startups launched two satellites into orbit today after suffering its first ever rocket failure two months ago. The launch comes during what's expected to be a busy month. Chinese rocket makers are boosting efforts to emerge as a local competitor to foreign rivals such as SpaceX, which is owned by Elon Musk, or Arian Space, which is backed by Airbus. All right. Lots Savannah, going on in space. No kidding. Getting crowded up there. All right. Thanks, yeah. Savannah. <laughs> yeah. well, let's turn now to America's longstanding love affair with fast food. Only this morning, there is a bit of mystery on the menu. This building we're going to show you in suburban Chicago has been receiving a lot of attention on social media. If you look closely there, you can see the name. It's pronounced Cosmics. The restaurant has yet to serve a single meal, but plenty of people are talking about it. And now we know it is backed by McDonald's. Well, NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the story from Bolingbrook, Illinois. Breaking McDonald's news. I've got the scoop on Cosmic. This morning in a nation long obsessed with fast food. And they've been super secret about it. Fans on social media are loving this supersized mystery. All right, here it is. Cosmics in Bolingbrook, Illinois. It looks like there are going to be four drive through lanes. Online sleuths are zeroing in on what appears to be a fast food joint in the making in suburban Chicago. Its name, Cosmics. A new venture McDonald's CEO announced on a July earnings call, promising it will have all the DNA of McDonald's, but its own unique personality, adding they'll test it in a small handful of sites in a limited geography beginning early next year. Beyond that, Cosmic's concept and menu are being kept tightly under wraps. We were just talking to her like, wait, when is it going to fully open or is it just already open? We're very excited. <laughs> Cosmic's roots likely to feed fans hunger for nostalgia. Cosmic here, I popped in from outer space on a trade mission. It's apparent namesake, an 80s era staple of McDonald's cast of characters. It's timing, marking an interesting era for America's so-called fast food wars. New data shows as of October, sales for fast food restaurants were up almost 2% compared to last year, despite a drop in customers. So how are restaurants keeping sales high? By hiking prices, experts say, a trend fueled by inflation and rising labor costs, and by heating up their marketing game, too. A lot of the things that McDonald's has done, you know, the adult Happy Meals, for instance, that they're doing right now again, is to get customers' attention 
they have to get people excited about going in again. The trick, experts add, will be turning this mounting Mick mystery into real value. Why is this, in your opinion, so captivating to Americans? Because everybody goes to McDonald's, even if you refuse to admit it. <laughs> Interesting note to add that on. Uh, back he out here live in Bolingbrook, guys, uh, we've showed you, you can see how the length McDonald's has gone to to kind of keep this under wraps. The sign is literally tarped. That being said, before this happened, I just want to show you the lengths people on social media went to to find out anything they could about Cosmics. One guy oh. posting images of what he says is the menu. And you can see if this is the official menu, it goes in hard on drinks. You can see iced teas, lemonades, something called a galactic boost. They have frappes. When it comes to the food, we see like a spicy queso sandwich and things like pretzel bites. Now, I cannot stress this enough. This is one guy, Savannah, on social media. McDonald's has confirmed nothing official tied to this menu. But that being said, another one of those earnings calls is scheduled for tomorrow. So our knowledge on this topic could get supersized very soon. So sorry about all the puns. Back to you. So, the line could get supersized, yeah. too. It's going to be I a know. crowded restaurant. Exactly. I know, like the way that in and out Wow, we can't wait to hear it. Maggie Vespa, stay on top of it for us. Thanks for your investigative reporting here. Well, 65 years after it was first released, a Christmas classic has now rocked its way to the top of the charts. Brenda Lee's Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree has reached the top of Billboard's Hot 100 chart for the very first time. The holiday favorite had 34.9 million streams and 20.7 million radio impressions between November 24th and 30th. You might get a sentimental feeling when you hear that Lee's original recording was released in 1958, but didn't even appear on the Hot 100 chart until 1960 <laughs> when it clocked in at number 64. I wish we had a little bit of it to play right now. I exactly. love that song. Exactly. And you know how old she was when she recorded it, right? No. 13. That's incredible. I know. It's That's awesome. such a good, such a good exactly. classic. Just made her first it. music video this year for it. There right. you go. Streaming services were meant to replace high cable prices and offer different options for customers in the market. But those same customers are now frustrated by the increased costs of streaming platforms. The answer is it bundling those services for a discount. One BC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans joins us now for more on this. Hey, Christine, good morning. Good morning. We're entering kind of a new phase of the streaming wars here. A, 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 a frugal consumer who might be pulling back and budgets getting a little tighter. More Americans expected to fine tune their, their list of streamers that they pay for. And it might mean that streamers have to pair up to keep your business. There is no war so hateful to the gods. It's a new phase in the streaming wars. Ooh. Starting Thursday, Verizon is offering a $10 a month Netflix Max bundle, but you have to watch the ads. It's a 40% discount from buying them separately. Apple TV and Paramount Plus reportedly exploring a bundle of their own. The police are considering this a missing person investigation. Robert, why are these services who are competitors, why do you think they're bundling now? All these services are responding to more and more disgruntled customers who don't like how much it's costing. If enemies have to come together to make customers come to both of them more efficiently, uh, then those en enemies will do just that. I'm getting real sick and tired of getting a new email every two or three business days about one of these streaming platforms raising their prices. The typical consumer on average pays for three services a month. Nearly one in 10 people have five or more. Watching Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and Hulu with ads would set you back 24 bucks a month. But to watch without ads, that cost more than doubles to $50. And all of a sudden, to watch simply the greatest stuff on TV it required two, three, four, five, now seven uh, different streaming services. Three, two, one. After a furious pace of new shows, many are bracing for a slowdown as filming starts back in the wake of the Hollywood strikes just as viewers are pulling back a little. And the subscription craze is not just Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. You'll be back soon, you see. Over the past decade or so, the subscription economy has quadrupled. It used to be just gyms and magazines. Now everything from meal kits, clothes, dog food, even cleaning supplies on subscribe and save, giving consumers convenience with potential costs for subscriptions they forgot about.
Yeah, I mean, if you don't cancel them, you're paying for these subscriptions every single month. Now, mm -hmm. many of these companies in the streaming wars haven't really figured out the business model just yet. So we're in peak content, right? We can watch so much great television, but they still haven't quite figured out the business model so they can make money. Netflix makes money. Some of these other streaming services still spending a lot to build content, but haven't been able to really capitalize uh, on the profit just yet. It's, and on my end, it's always this thing where it's like, I have a service because there's one show. I know. <laughs> I totally. want to watch you, get and you start doing like, the math example, and you're like... I got Disney Plus because of Hamilton. Exactly. Yeah. Well, like, and then that's what the bundling is kind of interesting. So here's the synergy. You've got, so Verizon or a company that has a phone and internet services, and they're offering discounted combination mm. potentially here. Yeah. That means they're attracting you and the content providers. It's, it's, it's a win-win all around if you get more eyeballs. Exactly. All right. All right. Mm. Mr. Right. Rowan, thank nice. you so much. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, after nearly 10 years of waiting, gamers can finally get a sneak peek of the latest installment in the iconic Grand Theft Auto franchise, setting it up to be one of the most anticipated video game releases of all time. Despite the hype and hope for Grand Theft Auto 6, 2023 has been one of the most catastrophic years for layoffs in the gaming industry. Here with more on this is NBC News reporter Callan Rosenblatt. She covers youth and internet culture, and the internet's certainly talking about this one. Hey, Callan, good morning. So walk us through the excitement around this new game and why it's such a big deal. Savannah, Joe, as you mentioned, it has been a 10-year wait for this game. Fans have had entire cottage industries pop up just trying to predict when this game will come out, just trying to predict what will be in this game. There are entire YouTube channels that are fully dedicated just to finding Easter eggs as to when this game would drop. Reddit pages, I've been waiting 10 years for this game. People still play GTA 5 to this day. It's one of the most popular online games. So the hype around this game is like, it's even hard to put into words, but the first trailer is finally here. It leaked last night, prompting Rockstar to follow and actually release the full trailer. And fans are just going wild over the visuals and the fact that we are returning to one of the iconic locations, Vice City, which is based on Miami, Florida. So as we now know, you do have to wait until 2025 for its release, though we do have this little peak right now in 2023. So I know we also learned there's going to be the first female protagonist in, in the franchise's history. Anything else we learned just from this little bit we have now? Yeah, so Savannah, it's the first uh, female protagonist that gets her own story. There were uh, female characters you could play as in the first game, but they weren't like crafted to be a female protagonist. This is the first female protagonist in what has been a heavily male dominated series. So that's a huge uh, part of this. And again, just the fact that we see that it is a Bonnie and Clyde style story set in an iconic location. These are things that fans have been uh, hoping would be in the series. There was a leak last year and we got some tidbits from that leak, which was unfortunate but uh, fans really excited about this one. So, Callan, 30 seconds here, but the LA Times says an estimated 6,500 video game workers were laid off this year. Why has this been a yeah. tough year for some developers? Uh, a couple different reasons, and I'll try to go through them really quick. Uh, first was, in the pandemic, there was a really big video game boom. You know, since then, belts have tightened in terms of the economy, and people are not buying luxury goods, and that includes video games. Additionally, some video game companies, you know, sort of spent money to make money, and that hasn't paid off in terms of job mm. security. So there's many reasons, but the industry is really hurting right now and hoping that GTA will be a way for the industry to rebound. Well, the hype around, it seems like maybe there's some hope for that. Callan Rosenblatt, <laughs> thank you so much. It's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But stay with us. Don't go anywhere because the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.